Good morning and welcome to this morning's Knowledge Bank. Um, my name is Vicky, I'm from News on the Block and today's session is being brought to you by Dorian Lawrence, Managing Director at FR Consultants. Um, Dorian is going to be discussing all things compliance with building safety regulations. If you have any questions throughout the session, then please submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen here. Um, and Dorian will try to get through as many as possible at the end. Uh, the session is being recorded today and um, will be available to watch back via our YouTube channel. Um, and if anyone would like a copy of the slides, um, then Hannah at FRC um, will also be able to supply them for you. Um, without further ado, I will now hand you over to Dorian. So he may begin the session. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Dorian Lawrence, the Managing Director of FR Consultants, and I'm here today to talk you through fire safety externally and also internally. Um, if you could go on to mute during the presentation, if you put all your questions in the chat, we've got Hannah Jackson today with us. She's going to read them all through at the end. So hopefully we can get through them. If we can't quite get through them all, we will email you the answers and how, uh, what we think about them and, uh, uh, and the best way forward for you. Please do, and I really actively encourage you to come up with as many questions as you can. Good, bad, indifferent, whatever you think. You might think you might not, it's not that relevant. Please come up with it because it might lead on to some something um, more uh, that will give you more benefit. Um, shortly after the presentation, you'll get uh, a link for a Google review. If you could do a Google review, we've been running these education sessions now for some five years. And as legislation and process has changed, and it's been quite a journey that we've been on, um, we do like to get a Google review, if possible, from anyone that would be greatly appreciated. But we do see educating the nation as a bit of a mission that we're on, trying to make sure that we're remediating the buildings to make sure they are safe as possible. So I'm a charter building surveyor and a charter building engineer with over 30 years experience in the facade and internal fire safety, a wealth of experience, whether it's design, compliance, regulation, construction and process. So a quick introduction into the business. We are a unique fire engineering and charter building consultancy offering a complete end-to-end -end solution with regards to facade and internal fire safety. So from the initial external wall survey, whether that's a PAS 9980 report, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail as we work through, or whether that is an EWS one form report and so on. We deal with all elements of the reports, but from there we identify the issues through to production of a robust tender pack, including design, to make sure that we get a new system on the building and internally to make sure that it is fully compliant. We oversee the works by our qualified clerk of works, building surveyors, quantity surveyors, fire engineers and designers and sign them off on completion to make sure that the buildings are remediated to the correct standard. All of those elements we deal with in-house. We're part of the RSK group, so a large group of 170 old businesses, so we have fantastic resources at our fingertips. We are chartered with the Chartered Institute of Building and also the Chartered Association of Building Engineers and members of the Institute of Fire Engineers. Um, we carry £10 million worth of PI with fire safety, so it's quite rare in this industry. Most have got one or two million, so that will give you an idea on how good we are at what we do, that we are able to get a quality policy that meets with lots of frameworks, requirements and also government frameworks. All our staff, whether they are a building surveyor, a quantity surveyor, a designer, a fire engineer, are all correctly qualified in their field. Our clients, we have a vast array of different clients, freeholders, managing agents, right to manage and resident managed companies, lenders, councils, and so on. We work quite closely with uh, Nationwide, helping assist them with some issues that they've got with regards to lending, what blocks are safe and what blocks aren't. We are also access facade and fire safety advisors. We don't just work in residential, we work in all other sectors as well, including shopping centres, schools, offices, etc. 
We also run a product development line. We're going to talk about a British standard 8414 test as we work our way through the slides. But it's a really good test that proves if a facade is compliant or not. We have a unique relationship with our firm of lawyers that we teamed up with some six years ago uh, to help our customers through this complex journey of legislation and work out who is liable for building the construction incorrectly. And that's worked very well uh, when we're trying to get developers or contractors to pay for the works. I sit on the Armour Building Safety Group with the DLUHC and also a Cladding Works on-site project engagement forum, which looks at how the legislation has changed, how resources needed in the industry, and how long this complex problem is going to take us to get through. So the agenda today, the first half is looking at some historical events and why we are in the mess that we are in. So if you just sit back and listen to that, the really interesting part is the second half from the Fire Safety Act onwards, which talks about new legislation right the way through to Fire Safety England regulations, the Building Safety Act, and how that process is now going to come into force and affect all of our residential buildings in some shape or form. But we're going to look at those in a lot of detail. Now, there is a massive amount of information in this presentation, and I don't apologise for that. There is too much for you to take in in one session but the part you really need to pay attention to is the second part because that is what's going to happen moving forwards so let's look at a timeline of exactly what's happened and why things have happened uh, in that way because it's quite uh, a complicated and confusing minefield of information but before we start looking at that information it's key that you understand how it has all started so if we go back to 1984 the building act enforcing the requirements to work to build in regulations and that act is still in place it hasn't been changed that you must work on a major project to building regulation. So when we're doing all of these remediation works, it is essential that the contractors, the developers, the designers and so on are working to build in regulation. So I make a point about that because we'll come on to funding in a bit and we'll look at the developers pledge and see what's going to happen with that. 2005, the fire safety order was introduced. 2006 and 2010, various changes to building regulations. There are lots of changes in regulations. We can't plot them all on here. That's just to give you a flavour of how many changes there are. So 2017, the tragic event at Grenfell Tower. We're going to look at that and I'm going to give you a few um uh, uh suggestions on what has happened and why it's happened and it's a really good case study to see the mess that our construction is in 2018 building regulations amended again and the government set up a series of advice notes one to 22 now please remember when we talk about building regulations uh they do not go back they do not cover old stock they are not retrospective they are only moving forwards and that's quite key and we can see how regs have changed Advice notes 1 to 22 retrospectively covered all of the old stock in England and Wales. Quite a confusing set of advice notes, um, not very good, a little bit clumsy uh, and contradicted each other in certain areas. 2019, the ACM was set up. First of all, it was thought that ACM, aluminium composite material, the same material that was on Grenfell cladding, uh, was the only issue. I went to the Home Office to demonstrate um, to the ML, uh, MHCLG, as it was then, uh, other products that were combustible. The fund was set up 200 million for private, 400 million for social. EWS1 form was introduced and please remember with the EWS1 form that is just a lender's form it is not a health and safety document building safety bill was announced followed by the fire safety bill announced two key parts of new legislation which we're going to look at in a fair bit of detail consolidated advice note was produced superseded the complicated and confusing advice notes 1 to 22 34 pages quite a blunt instrument quite clumsy to use if you had combustible material it said remove it and it was pretty much as simple as that not quite right and we're going to look at some examples of that 
Building Safety Bill first draft announced 2020 and registration opened for the £1 billion Building Safety Fund. We've got about 100 odd blocks going through that uh, fund. And again, that's quite a difficult fund to work with because it doesn't cover all of the items. Building regulations amended again. Government announces a plan for three and a half billion, which turned out to be four and a half billion, and then new EWS1 guidance released. Uh, Mr. Jemrick announced a proportionality statement saying that if you had a block between 11 and 18 metres, you must assume that it is safe and then increase the risk as you gather more data. That couldn't have been any further from the truth. You must always assume that the risk is high and reduce that risk as you gather the data. That's in accordance with the RICS and the Institute of Fire Engineers guidance. 2021, the Fire Safety Act passes. And 2022 developers pledge announced that seems to have confused a lot of people to exactly how much work the developers are going to rectify. But we will see with that as we work our way through. Consolidated advice note retired. The PAS 9980 published. Don't worry, we're going to look at that in detail. The Fire Safety Act commences, making it mandatory to do an external wall report and consider the rest of the building and to a PAS 9980 standard. Fire Safety England regulations commenced and then the Building Safety Act due to commence in 2023. Now, the reason from I've put so much information into that slide from 2017 onwards, it is colossal. The changing building regulations, advice notes, government guidance, funding, it has been very difficult to track through the process. So first of all, let's look at some historical fires and see exactly what has happened. So right the way back to 1973, Summerland on the Isle of Man. Uh, construction, uh, during the design, it wasn't thought about the fire risk, the problems. It had combustible cladding, combustible insulation. 53 people lost their lives. Fire escapes were locked. It was an absolute disaster. However, moving forward to 2009, the Lackanor House fire, the fire spread up two stories as well as down internally two stories. It had high pressure laminate, that's wood chippings and resin compressed together with a face material, highly combustible. It had a stay put policy. It had poor compartmentation internally. The key point of all those facts is no one was prosecuted for the deaths in the block. Six people were killed and they couldn't attribute blame to an individual party. The Cube, Manchester, high pressure laminate cladding and Celotex insulation, two of the most combustible materials that you could put on a building, 2016. And then as, as recent as 2019, Samuel Garside House over in Barking had uh, wooden cladding and decking uh, with insect mesh, a pigeon netting around them with resin on it. The resin caught fire off of a bar barbecue and destroyed the uh, building completely. Uh, no one was killed in that fire. People were injured in there, but it destroyed the asset um, completely, 100%. So let's look at the modern methods of construction so that you can understand why uh, we have used these methods of construction. So first of all, if you look at the photo on the right hand side there, you'll see the red lines which denote a steel or concrete frame. So that would be erected quite quickly. And then into the wall section, a lightweight metal stub work is fitted to support the cladding, a very fast form of construction. And to that, a bolt material is fitted and then the window and doors are installed. Now, whilst the internal trays can carry on in, uh, internally, the first fix can commence, externally, the cladding and insulation can go on. It's not dependent on the weather in most instances. The speed of construction is typically 40% faster. Change in building regs, we needed to insulate our buildings better. This gives us two cavities to insulate, so it gives some fantastic U values. And we have a massive housing shortage. We are typically 250,000 units a year short. I was with Homes England last week looking at that shortage, and there is a colossal amount of units that we need to catch up, and we just aren't producing enough units. This method of construction, typically from 1996 onwards, has really helped try and catch up that deficit. 
And if we look at the through wall construction, now all of our reports must look at the complete through wall. So item one being the plasterboard construction on the inside of the apartment. Item two is that board material that we spoke about in the previous slide fitted to that metal type stud work. And item three, creating a cavity, which in this instance, we've shown filled with rock wall insulation. Item four is the rain screen void, the cavity there that is filled with uh, insulation. Now, in this case, we've shown a rock wall type. A lot of the time between 1996 and 2015, we find combustible insulation used in that location. And you might think, well, why is combustible insulation being used? Because it has a fantastic insulation value. It is highly combustible, uh, PIR, expanded um, polystyrene insulations. It's highly combustible, but the insulation value is, is fantastic. Item five is the cladding, and that could be anything from aluminium composite material uh, right the way through to high pressure laminate, brick slips, and so on, a multitude of different types of cladding. Cavity barriers and fire barriers. So when we look at uh, the locations, we must identify where they are on each building. And they will be in five locations, or they should be in five locations. A lot of the time we find out, 92% of our reports, we find that somewhere they are missing or the wrong type of barrier has been used. So they must be around windows, horizontally at slab level to stop the fire spreading vertically, vertically at compartment walls to stop the fire spreading around the building horizontally, to interface with the facade on the roof to stop the uh, fire getting into the roof space and spreading across, and then around penetrations, i.e. flues, extract fans, and so on. And the number of times we open up uh, extract fans from bathrooms and kitchens, and we just find a plastic sleeve um, and there is no thought or material in there to stop the fire spreading uh, either from inside the building and out and vice versa. So that gives you a snapshot of how this construction is assembled. Again, we could talk about construction and modern methods uh, in, a, in an eight hour session. So that's just to give you a flavor. So cladding products and testing. Let's look at these because they all start to fall into place when we start to look at regulations in a minute. Now, post Grenfell, uh, British Standard 8414 test was commissioned to see how the product burned. So to explain that test, it's a test rig, 9.675 metres by 2.8 by 1.5 metres. It doesn't have a window in it, which is a, is a uh, criticism of the test. So it doesn't quite reflect how the fire may spread up the building. The combustion chamber is ignited and it is burnt for 30 minutes and the temperatures at levels one and two are monitored. And it's key to note that if the flames reach the top of the combustion chamber within the first um, uh, uh, the first 30 minutes of the test, that will be an immediate fail. So uh, it is a massive issue when we look at what actually happened at the, with Grenfell and the cladding there when that was tested. Now on the table on the left hand side, we can see there ACM with unmodified polythene filler with PIR foam insulation. The test was undertaken and the flames reached the top of the rig within six minutes. So it failed very, very quickly. They are the exact materials as used at Grenfell, the cheapest option out of all of those options in the table. However, if we come down to the first line in white, you will see the ACM with fire retardant polythene filler with mineral wall insulation, a more expensive form of construction, but that passed the test. So I come back to Grenfell and I do think that the majority of the reasons and why it happened was down to cost. Then when we look at the standards that we work to, first of all, we have a, in a British standard spread of flame. And it's quite an easy test to get. It's a piece of material with a Bunsen burner type flame against it. The ACM at Grenfell still gets a class zero spread of flame. The flame is held against the material for 20 minutes. If it spreads more than 160 millimetres, it is a fail. Like I say, it's quite an easy test to get. 
However, if we have a Euro class combustibility rating of the complete material, it is a rigorous test to pass and to get your classification. First of all, some of the material is ground up uh, into a powder and it undergoes a bomb calorimeter test to see what energy it produces when it is ignited. Then a large sample of the material is put into a high temperature oven uh, for two hours to see how it behaves under extreme temperatures. However, well, if we look at the chart there, Euro class A1, non-combustible materials, as you would think, mineral wall type insulation, the type of insulation you've probably got in your roof space, terracotta, concrete, plain aluminium, so without any decorative coating on it. However, scroll down to Euro class E, very high risk, so highly combustible material. The manufacturers of expanded polystyrene, and this is also part of the reason we are in the position that we are in, is that they produce a flame retardant EPS, or so they call it. But however, it is a Euro class E rating. It is very high, highly combustible. It is only slightly better than the standard EPS rendering insulation. So part of the reason we are in the mess that we are in with our construction and our combustibility is manufacturers misleading and telling us that their product is flame retardant, but it definitely is not. And that has led us in to a massive issue. Cladding products and burn rates. So to explain and to make it quite simple, how do these products behave when combusted. And if we look at the heat value in the right hand side there, you'll see megajoules per kilogram. So the Renabond PE55 ACM, that is the material that is used on Grenfell Tower with a phalonic foam type insulation. Those produce 72 megajoules per kilogram. So 43 for the Renabond and 29 for the Flonic foam. That is a colossal amount of energy. However, if a rock wall, stone wall type insulation had been used and a rock panel FS extra had been used, they would have produced less than five. So a colossal difference. To give you some context, look at further down, you'll see diesel fuel burns at 42 to 46. So a massive amount of energy that was produced off of those products. Now, I use Grenfell as an example because we must never forget it. But that is the same construction as thousands and thousands of buildings across the UK. So HPL, just to give you a, a, a flavour of how these products burn, small sample, three inches by an inch and uh, combusted in a very low temperature, 300 degrees Celsius fire. But you can see there from the bottom of that as the flames igniting as they're catching the resin uh, alight, wood chippings and resin compressed together. And within 10 minutes, the whole of that sample is gone. You could ignite a piece of a uh, high pressure laminate with a cigarette lighter. It is that combustible and highly dangerous. Used not just a lot in residential buildings, spandrel panels uh, and cladding, but also hospitals, schools. Um, a colossal amount of the material was sold between 1998 and 2015. Let's look at insulations just to give you uh, an example of how these burn. Look at the insulation on the right hand side, the PIR thermal insulation. Um, it is uh, colossally combustible and it reaches flashover in 30 seconds. Flashover being the point at which the material is at the temperature where it will combust. Look at the volume of fumes coming off that in 25 seconds. A colossal amount of poisonous fumes containing cyanide. Look at the rock wall on the left hand side, the thermal wall. Um, insulation that is not combusting at all that's just the ignition chamber there a light but we can see at 30 seconds how the PIR insulation is combusting now that's internally so it's got no wind or draft being drawn to the uh, oxygen in a small cavity so I think it would combust even quicker if it was enclosed in a cavity without any proper compartmentation 
expanded polystyrene now you might have seen the articles in bristol bristol city council have just condemned uh, their blocks with eps on there was a death in one of their blocks uh, recently um, where the external cladding was an issue as well as the internal uh, compartmentation and fire doors however look at this test in two minutes three and a half minutes we can see uh, it starts to combust now this isn't an 8414 test it's better than that one it's outside two it has a window in the uh, test rig but round about five and a half minutes the face of the render falls away leaving exposed EPS and the volume of fumes coming off of that building now this is the video that I presented uh, at the home office to show look we need to look at all of these other products in the market but a colossal amount of heat energy and fumes being produced from that sample um, yeah, we quite like this test. It's, it shows that the window has gone above, the glass has gone, and it then would allow the fire to hop up the building. Now, that's only two stories, that test rig. And when you think about it, um, you know, two stories, if that was 10 stories, we've got blocks that are 24 stories, clad in EPS. Um, rock wall, a mineral wall type insulation. Um, uh, shown here um, once it's extinguished it just simply doesn't catch fire some of the surface material has fallen away but it is all still intact a really really good um, non-combustible system however it doesn't have as good thermal properties as EPS however you can see the EPS there completely destroyed 100% gone so what would happen internally the fire would also spread internally where it was getting in through each window so a massive problem with regards to uh, expanded polystyrene um, forms of render systems. So Grenfell Tower, it is, uh, we must never forget what happened there and uh, the issues. But I'm going to give you a few facts about what's come out so far. I really like the podcasts um, that there are on um, what's happening each week. We can understand how the whole construction process has failed. Um, Grenfell Tower contained 120 flats made up of social housing and underwent a major refurbishment in 2016. Those bids started off with Chelsea and Kensington um, getting bids at round about 13, 14 million. The contract was placed at just over 9 million. There was some serious value engineering uh, that went on through that process. Ryden Construction won the contract and between Ryden and Harley Curtain Walling, they had a million pound error on their estimate. So they had to reduce costs or increase value by a million pounds to get back to their tender margin and the money that they wanted to make. The cladding was made up of Renabond ACM with a polythene core and Celatex RS5000 uh, insulation. They also used K Kingspan K15. You may have heard that Kingspan manufactured K15 insulation, but the product that they manufactured and sold wasn't the same that they tested. They removed 90% of the flame retardant, but still sold it as the same products we are uh, informed. So a major issue with manufacturers. We'll talk about that when we come on to the Building Safety Act and how that won't be able to happen again. Dr. Roth Palaktu said that uh, an expert in fire investigation that the polythene in the cladding would have burned as quickly as petrol. And we agree with that because on the research that we've done and various different data that we've examined, that is correct. Dr. Barbara Lane said as early as the 12th of April 2018 that all of those products listed there on the screen in the external wall separately or put together as a wall system would not have met building regulations B41. Now we're going to look at B41 when we get to the building regulations section um, because it is key to um, regulations and how we can prove non-compliance with that regulation on historic blocks of flats. We're having great success with that at the moment, taking costs away from the lessees so they do not have to pay for the works. 
the fire spread at Grenfell, started on the fourth floor, spread from to the 17th floor in 16 minutes, 22 seconds. It should have taken 14 hours to do that journey. It should have contained for an hour at each level, but it didn't. Several reasons for that. The first one, emails have come out between Ride and Construction and Harley Curtain Walling that the cavity barriers around the windows have been removed due to cost. Now that they've been removed, they're starting to get down to the right budget. Think about that million pound error. They've got to work out between them to get those costs reduced. Also, this specific fin detail on the building, see the red arrow on the bottom left there, pointing towards a triangular void. There was no compartmentation in that void. Fire would come out of the window. It would catch the ACM and the insulation alike on the inside of what I would describe as a 24-story chimney up the side of the building. Now, all of our reports, we see specific design details like this on many other buildings. We must check the details of those specific items but that would have caused a major contribution towards the spread of flame so why are we in this mess that we're in why are our building regulations so poor that we have allowed ourselves to get in the uh, with a very poor quality housing stock I'm going to give you a couple of examples. And again, we could run an eight hour session just on building rigs. I'll probably send you all to sleep. But it, it, it is very com complicated and confusing. So let's look at some regulations from 2006. The external surfaces of the wall within a thousand millimetres of the relevant boundary should meet class O or class B. Class O, that very simple test to get. Class B, a Euro class rating. So or, where is that or? Surely that should be class zero and class A2 or better. The total amount of combustible material on walls more than a thousand mil from the relevant boundary may be limited. Very open-ended, non-specific terms. It gets worse in 2010, external wall construction. The external envelope of the building should not provide a medium for fire spread if it is likely to be a risk to health and safety. It is likely, we know that. The use of combustible materials in the cladding system and extensive cavities may present such a risk in tall buildings. There's no may about it. There's a global study that's been undertaken that says they do contribute. Now, those terms should likely and maybe are very open ended, non specific terms. And who then decides exactly what they mean? Is it the architect? Is it the team of designers? Is it the contractor, the subcontractor, the warranty provider, the professional indemnity insurance company? There is a raft of different bodies within that complex chain in construction. Very difficult to attribute blame. And that has been addressed in the Building Safety Act. So some good changes to regulations coming in now, remembering that regulations uh, aren't retrospective. They are only moving forward on new projects, but remaining positive, all of our new stock then that comes to the market from 11 metres onwards, building regulations on the 1st of December this year will be changed to say that all materials of 11 metres and above external in the external wall must be non-combustible. So a great change. It also outlaws ACM. So not just using ACM on residential buildings, on all buildings, depending on the category of it and the combustibility, but outlaws it as a, as a product. So again, from... Uh, the end of this year onwards. So new stock coming to the market should be uh, very, very safe. And lots of confusion around balconies. Balconies are a massive issue. Um, there's always argument about when does the balcony wall become part of the external wall? Where's the regulations about the decking or the floor construction? That confusion cannot be generated anymore. So with these changes in regulations, anything with regards to the attachment to the balcony has to be non-combustible in a building of 11 metres or more. So moving forward, great news. Our new stock should be very compliant.
Also, we made a change in 2020 saying that any building with a floor height of over 11 metres, as shown in diagram D6 on the bottom left there, must have sprinklers installed. So uh, that is only new build. Remember, new buildings or big buildings being uh, um, refurbished or change of use. So, um, But a sprinkler system must be fitted. And the stat on that is there have been no fatalities in England in a residential building fitted with a sprinkler system also massively reduces the insurance cost as well so which is a, a major problem in the industry especially at the moment with um, many many thousands of buildings having reports on, undertaken above and below 18 meters now for me and for frc this is where it gets quite interesting so in 1984 this clause came in now please remember it has no height restriction. Think about B41, what we said back at Grenfell, that the external wall didn't meet B41. And that clause says the external walls of the building shall adequately resist the spread of fire over the walls and from one building to another, having regard to the height use and position of the building. And now we use this clause on many different types of buildings. And there are several cases which we're going to have a quick look at now. So down in Gospel, two tower blocks uh, were refurbished and uh, by Hyde Housing, where the housing association that owned them, Mulali was the contractor. Mulali lost everything. Um, the expanded polystyrene, the EPS, uh, was used with two thin coats of render, three mil and one and a half mil, very similar to the sample that we looked at in that fire. The contractor lost, um, they didn't just lose the cost of uh, remediating because it didn't comply with B41. They also lost uh, all of the ancillary costs like waking watch, all of the fees and so on, because it didn't comply with clause B41. So some really good evidence in a very recent case that we would use to demonstrate that works are unsafe. Another case with Grenfell, what the judges actually said there, and this is as early as the 26th of April 2019, and he talks about clause B41 and says, although in another context there might be room for argument about the precise scope of the word adequately, it inevitably contemplates that the exterior must resist the spread of fire to some significant degree appropriate to the height, use and position. He then goes on to say that quite clearly it did not resist the spread of flame it actually promoted it engulfing the block within two and a half hours. So um, a major issue. Now you might say, well, all those buildings are over 18 meters. What happens if you've got a block below 18 meters? Now this is a block that we deal with over in Essex. Um, it is pretty well built, to be fair, uh, brick and block work. However, around all the balconies and above all of the entrances, which are classed as fire escapes as well, is category three combustible ACM. They had a fire started off of a mattress and a cigarette end, a bit of wind, caught the foam alight and so on and uh, caught the ACM alight and destroyed the block. Fire didn't spread uh, horizontally around the building, compartmentation was pretty good. Um, however, fire service got involved and said, we need to look at this building and see uh, exactly what has happened. They looked at the products. They said, you must be confused at the product that you've used because you've used a Euroclass E product um, and uh, you shouldn't have used that product. However, they then also went on to say, now bearing in this is completely independent, London Fire Brigade, uh, Ian Bailey, the uh, one of the group managers there, then went on to say, your building does not meet the functional requirements of the building regulations clause B41. So if you're involved in a dispute on a building above and below 18 metres of any height, ask whoever is saying they've met building rigs to show you how they have complied with clause b41 to show that it is non-combustible so some quite interesting evidence i think we'll see some more cases come out in the not too distant future of how they haven't complied with the correct mandatory b41 regulation um, moving on, uh, a quick update, London Fire Brigade, who I think are doing a fantastic job, um, especially when we look at 
deaths uh, within tall buildings within London uh, and the expansion of London horizontally and vertically. You know, the number of tall buildings that we've got going up and deaths are reducing. So they've introduced um, 26 of the 29 recommendations uh, from the Grenfell Tower inquiry. Um, the introduc introduction of an electronic system to record fire survival guidance and dedicated fire survival guidance offices. Officers, there will be one at the site and one in the control room coordinating the fire. They've also introduced a lot of additional kit, three 64 meter ladders and eight new 32 meter ladders. So really good uh, investment. And also some fire escape hoods, which give 15 minutes of clean air to help people get out of the building. So fantastic move by London Fire Brigade. Moving forward and our housing stock gets safer, hopefully uh, we won't have to uh, use them as much, but uh, a massive positive, which we find in this sector, we must always remain positive, especially with the problems that we've gone through and going through when it comes to funding. So a quick look at the consolidated advice note, just to give you a flavour of what's happened there. Um, the advice note for building owners of multi-storey, multi-occupied residential buildings introduced in January 2020, but retired in January 2022. Quite a clumsy document, 34 pages, pretty much said if you've got anything there combustible, you need to remove it. That was retired and replaced when the Fire Safety Act came out. So the Fire Safety Act 2021. So if you are a responsible person, a managing agent, a director of an RTM or RMC, this is the part where you need to really pay attention. So the Fire Safety Act 2021 uh, introduced uh, on the 19th of March 2020, but came into full force in England on the 16th of May 2022. And the Fire Safety Act is the first legislative step in the process of implementing the recommendations from the Grenfell Tower inquiry. Now, the Fire Safety Act 2021 makes essential amendments to the Regulatory Reform 2005 Fire Safety Order. There was always a bit of confusion about whether the external wall was included or not. I think it was always included in the 2005, uh, 2005 Fire Safety Order. However, it definitely is now. So it's amended to say that the external wall is included. Broken down into four simple sections. I'm going to look at those four sections in a little bit more detail. All multi-occupied buildings of any height in England and Wales must have a fire risk assessment, which takes into account via an FRAEW. And that stands for fire risk appraisal of the external wall. So you must look at the structure and the external wall. So right the way through, as we looked at on that early slide, right the way through to the thickness of the plasterboard internally, the inner leaf, the insulation, the cladding, the support structure, the cavity barriers, and so on. All attachments to the external wall must be reviewed. So not just balconies, there could be some solar shading, electric car chargers, green wall construction. Uh, we had a meeting recently um, with a um, manufacturer of green wall where the internal tray was plastic, Euro class F, so uh, highly dangerous, although it is irrigated. Um, so you must consider all of those elements. Doors and windows within the external wall must now be considered. And it's generally thought that steel and timber windows will be acceptable and that aluminium uh, and plastic won't be unless the plastic has a metal uh, steel insert. Doors between domestic premises and common parts must be uh, considered and uh, doors in the common areas as well. So front doors into the apartments at Grenfell, they were really poorly installed and cheap construction. They failed in many, many occasions. So they must be checked to make sure that they are of the right standard and the right quality. Section two is the power to change the premises to which the fire safety order applies and who can change that. And in England, that is the Secretary of State. And in Wales, it is the Welsh Minister. 
Uh, section three is the risk-based guidance. It talks about how are we going to look at all of these buildings in the same format, in the PAS 9980 format. And we have quite a few auditing roles in FRC, and we see lots of PAS reports produced by others that aren't quite up to standard. They haven't got all the items. We're going to look at how you do a PAS report in a minute. So you must make sure that the reports you have undertaken have sufficient detail in them because that report could be used in a legal case if there is an issue to prove contravention or no contravention with the Fire Safety Act. Section four talks about commencement. England, 16th of May this year came into full force. In Wales, I love what the Welsh have done with fire safety, really proactive. They brought it in on the 1st of October 2021. They also have a fantastic building safety fund, which is slowly working its way through. Government have introduced the fire risk assessment prioritisation tool. Not mandatory that you use it, but I would suggest if you are the responsible person or a managing agent that you upload a version of it. It's very simple to use. Um, it could be used to prove whether you have acted correctly or not. You have to gather all of this information on the left hand side from the height of the building right the way down there to details of any recent fires. We can help you with all of that should you need it. And then it will give you a result tiered from one to five. We really need to pay, pay attention is tiers one and two. It is essential that um, you make sure that you take immediate action or action as soon as practically possible. But definitely worth uploading a version of that and just trying it, see what information you've got. It's a good process to check what information you actually keep on file. So the Fire Safety Act 2021 in summary, um, so the Act clarifies the responsible persons for multi-occupied residential buildings must manage and reduce the risk of fire for the structure and external walls. From now on in England and Wales, the responsible person has a legal responsibility to commission a fire risk assessment. It applies to all multi-occupied residential buildings and is not dependent on the height of the building. It allows the fire and rescue service to enforce against non-compliance. So they've now got more powers to deal with all issues. So how are we going to do those reports? The fire risk appraisal of the external wall to the PAS 9980. So hopefully I can clarify all of that for you. So a bit of information about the PAS, um, and it was released on the 12th of January 2022. Now my team at FRC, whether a building surveyor or fire engineer, are all correctly qualified to undertake these reports. The FRAW, to which the PAS refers to, is not within the competence of a typical fire risk assessor. So your type one fire risk assessor will attend your block of flats and say, yes, it looks like you've got some form of cladding on the building. Therefore, I need to get an FRAEW. And where an FRAEW is considered necessary, the PAS is, is provide to provide recommendations and guidance. So a proper PAS report will give you the reasons why it will tell you what you need to do in the interim and it will tell you what you need to do as a full-time uh, long-term remedial solution. It is about risk. It is risk-based. So what we do is we look at the risk in each one of these silos. So whether it is the fire performance of the materials right the way through that wall construction, the facade configuration, uh, the building height, height of cladding above ground, extent of cladding and so on. And then any fire strategy measures, for example, occupancy being one of them, uh, student accommodation is considered much higher risk than um, private um, occupancy. Uh, evacuation strategy, escape route design, and so on. Now, we really like this form of looking at risk because you're looking at each different silo for each different wall type. And we'll look at each one, we'll give it a positive, neutral, or negative risk for each element of those. And then we will gather those risks up and calculate exactly where the building sits, whether it is safe or not. And we gather it in a tabular format so it can be easily explained to lessees, managing agents, principal accountable persons, the fire service, whoever it may be. It's all set out in a standard format. 
and then we will plot those items. As I said previously, always assuming that the risk is high. So first of all, we would look at the fire performance of materials. And then, if possible, because of the facade configuration, we can reduce risk and then further reduce risk as we work our way down through because of the fire strategy and fire hazards. So let's look at how that would work in the real world. So we have a building here, brick and block. The render is directly onto block work. So it's not onto expanded polystyrene like we looked at in that video. There is, however, at high levels, some high pressure laminate cladding with combustible insulation. However, it is quite a small area. So let's look at that scale on the bottom of the slide there. So baseline, when we look at materials, the material is highly combustible, so it remains in the high category. However, let's look at facade configuration. It is surrounded with non-combustible material. It is set back from the apartments below. So it's fairly well protected. So we can reduce risk because of the quantity as well. It is only a small area. But we can then look at fire strategy and fire hazards. The building is fitted with a sprinkler system. So the chances of a fire spreading out internally to that cladding is very, very small. So on this building, we allowed that cladding to stay and said that it was reasonably safe to be left. However, if you worked under old guidance, under the consolidated advice note, you would not be able to leave that cladding in place. So that's been quite uh, interesting to track the changes in guidance and legislation as we have worked our way through um, from guidance under the CAN and the old advice notes through now to the PAS 9980 in accordance with the Fire Safety Act. There's an expected skills matrix uh, within the PAS guidance, so it sets out who can do what. So that's really good. But it's not just about the qualification. It's about making sure that the persons are competent and have the understanding of the system. So we spend a lot of time running training sessions in-house for all of our staff. We appreciate that lots of people have spent some considerable money on having reports undertaken. So if possible, we will take those old style reports in the form of a facade or fire engineers report and then try and um, use that data where possible. We would then, um, if you didn't have any information on the building or you hadn't uh, had any reports done, we will deal with all elements of uh, that process from the traffic management, road closures, abseiling, uh, access equipment, right the way through the complete process. And also, don't forget, you will need a fire door survey of all of the apartment doors and also the doors to the common areas. So further regulations, Fire Safety England regulations 2022. Now, obviously, these only affect buildings in England. And it introduces new duties under, under the Regulatory Reform 2005 Fire Safety Order that workplaces um, includes workplaces and common parts of all multi-occupied residential buildings. And it's a requirement uh, by law and will require the responsible persons in multi-occupied residential buildings over 11 metres in height to provide additional safety measures. Comes into effect on the 23rd of January next year. So if you are that person you need to be and you are the responsible person, you need to make sure that you're on top of this. And it's going to basically mean that you have to have a secure information box. And that secure information box must contain all of the information there as listed on the right hand side of the screen. Um, it is a common sense approach which then says that you've got all the information in there when the fire service turn up that they have all the details of the building so that they can tackle the fire correctly and in a professional manner. Now certain elements apply to certain blocks and it um, uh, I've broken it down on this slide to show exactly what applies to where. So residential buildings with two or more domestic premises with common areas. So your small blocks. You must use the fire risk assessment prioritization tool. You must 
send information to the residents about fire safety instructions and information to residents on the importance of fire doors in a building and how they affect the safety. You don't have to have a fire door survey in those smaller blocks. Residential buildings of 11 to 17.9 metres, you've got two items one, two and three, plus a fire door survey, remembering that this comes into effect on the 23rd of Jan 23. Residential buildings have the higher risk, 18 metres or seven storeys and above in height. You've got to do items one to four plus have a secure information box. You must have the and know the design and materials of the external wall and also floor plans and building plans showing the escape routes, lifting and fire lifts and firefighting equipment, full details of those. So if you've got a firefighting lift in there and the service history and wayfinding signage. So if you need any help with those regulations and meeting compliance, we've put together a solution uh, to deal with all elements on that and installing the box and so on, scanning the building, producing the information. Personal emergency and evacuation plans, PEEPs. And I've left that stat in there as disturbing as it is that 41% of disabled people who lived at Grenfell perished in the fire, um, which is absolutely disgraceful. This must never happen again. The fire safety consultation uh, consulted on the proposal of PEEPs, a personal emergency and evacuation plan, but found that the issue was extremely complex. And the government has sought further views from those most likely to be impacted through a public consultation. So this is going to change very, very shortly. We will be putting a video on YouTube about it when it comes out. We do have several videos on there on the Fire Safety Act and the Building Safety Act already. But there's going to now be a different process um, and it's called emergency and evacuation information sharing. So you'll see it change name to an EEIS. You must make sure that anyone with a mobility issue, you know who they are, you know what that mobility issue is, you know how you are going to get them out of the building. Make sure that you put all that information into your secure information box and make sure that you've sent it to the fire service so that in the event of a fire, they know exactly who is in what flat and how they are going to get them out. So that covers the Fire Safety Act, Fire Safety England, and also um, personal emergency and evacuation plans. So some key parts of legislation. Don't forget what buildings uh, they apply to. Now, this is where it gets very interesting. So construction, we must remember, has been poorly governed by regulations up until now. Building regulations below 18 metres, in my opinion, the advisory sections are pretty weak and quite poor. Um, over 18 metres, um, there is some uh, quite clear regulations and uh, most developers, contractors seem to have missed that they should have worked the clause B41. However, the Building Safety Act 2022 is now a 300 page plus document which talks about new regulations and how we're going to make sure all of our buildings are safe. So it comes into full effect on the 28th of April 2023. And the more rigorous regime set out in the Act will apply to residential buildings of seven storeys or 18 metres in height, whichever comes first, and applies throughout the life cycle of new buildings and at occupation stage to existing buildings in scope. The principal accountable person will be required to obtain a building assurance assessment certificate in a similar process as for new builds. There will be a staged transition period and the building safety regulator will take into account the information available to the accountable person at the time of the application. You will have to gather the golden thread of information. And the intention of the golden thread is to ensure that the right people have the right information at the right time to ensure buildings are safe and building safety risks are managed throughout the building's life cycle. And the principal accountable person is responsible for preparing the safety case and evidencing the safety case report for approval by the building safety regulator at gateway three for occupation. Now we're going to look at those gateways in a moment um, and explain exactly how they work. 
Now, the information across the bottom of the screen, uh, this took, has taken us a considerable amount of time to put to this slide together, but that is all the information in yellow that you will have to gather for your building assessment case. So we're going to have to make sure that um, you've got everything there that you need, but it's fairly common sense information. We can help you with all of that if you haven't got drawings, plans, um, anything you need, structural assessment, structural surveys, secure information box, etc. Now all of that information feeds into the safety case. The green items are the residence items that you would need to engage with them as the principal accountable person. And the items in blue are the items that the developer and contractor would need to produce with regards to the construction. Now, if you haven't got all of that information there in blue on existing buildings, again, we can help you with all of that. That all feeds into the safety case up to the building safety regulator to get, to get the building assurance certificate. So uh, quite a process, one, just gathering the information, two, then producing the building safety case and submitting it. So let's look at those safety cases and a safety case report. A safety case is a structured argument supported by evidence intended to justify that a system is acceptably safe for a specific application in a specific operating environment. A safety case should provide all information used to manage the building's risk of fire spread and detail the structural safety of a building. So it's not just about the cladding, it's about the structure and it's about the internals as well. So how will that fire spread if it's in a kitchen? How will it spread to communal areas? How will it affect the structure? How will it affect any cladding or external wall system that you have? A safety case report is a document that summarizes the safety case to identify the building's major fire fire and structural hazards. And if you put yourself in the building safety regulators position, they are not going to be able to read 13,000 full reports. They need a summary of it. There is a new British standard 8644, um, which has been published on how to manage fire safety information digitally. So we've now got some very clear guidance. And again, we can help you with all of that process, but it must be done to the British standard in the correct format, in the correct sequence. And the building safety manager, you might have heard Michael Gove when he was previously employed in the job that he's come back to, saying that the building safety manager uh, wasn't a mandatory requirement. But if you think about who is going to put that building safety case together and gather that information and check it's all compliance, you're going to need someone in that case. And I actually think building safety manager is a fantastic description of their role. So the role is designed to answer two fundamental questions. Can the building safety risk be identified clearly and efficiently in the building? And can evidence be shown for how these risks are managed on an ongoing basis as far as practically possible? So um, a very sensible position. You've got to have one body there or person um, producing this. And the way that we work is, first of all, we would do a gap analysis. Look at all that information in yellow uh, to make sure, and the items in blue to make sure that you've got it on all your existing buildings. Much easier for new builds. We do lots of new builds, 32 blocks going through at the moment. We gather that information during the construction process. Step two is about filling the gap. So what information is missing? We'll produce that information, then put the safety case together, and then look at the ongoing management, making sure the items in that safety case are upheld and the building is correctly managed and maintained. There's lots of queries about where all of the costs for this sit. So we went to Blake Morgan, we studied the Building Safety Act in detail, myself included, and these elements are chargeable. So the building safety case and gathering the information um, and the FRAW under the Fire Safety Act to the correct PAS standard are chargeable to the service charge in most instances. Um, so uh, the lessees will have a bill for these works, which um, I think it could be quite considerable in some cases, depending on what information is available. We're looking at the most efficient ways to do a condition survey. We're now doing them off of, off of drones to keep, the, to keep the cost as low as possible. 
The Building Safety Regulator, uh, the Building Safety Act introduces the BSR um, to enforce a new more stringent regulatory regime. It's got its official title um, and the Building Safety Regulator is working closely with local authorities and fire and rescue authorities. So um, again, I think as everyone with regards to resource, they are struggling to get the right resource in place at the right time. Um, there's a new PAS 8673 introduced to talk about competencies uh, and how a person's undertaking the building safety manager role or any other role in this process, we should be checking that they are competent, have the right qualifications and experience as well. Remember, it's not just about that qualification. It must be relevant and they must have an understanding of the process. So let's look at the roles and responsibilities, a brief overview. The BSR, Building Safety Regulator, is going to lead the implementation of the new regulatory framework for high-rise buildings. Now, there's going to be a national regulator for construction products. Go back to what I mentioned earlier about Kingspan, K15, EPS that they say is flame retardant. All of those uh, products will now have to go through the national regulator for construction products. A really smart bit of uh, legislation and introduction uh, to the process. There's going to be a principal accountable person, maybe an individual partnership or corporate body, <coughs> excuse me, um, and uh, there could be, but there could be several principal accountable persons within a block of flats. Building safety manager, and the way that I describe them, they're going to be the boots on the ground, working for the principal accountable person, uh, making sure that all of the information is gathered and the building assessment case is put together properly and that ongoing maintenance and management items are undertaken. Now, there will be clear duty holders. Go back to the Lackanall uh, house fire where no one was prosecuted. There will be clear duty holders for each element of the process. And they're going to have clear roles and responsibilities. So the client, the principal designer, designers, contractors, subcontractors, everyone will have clear duties to which they must upheld. So uh, go back to that fire. Now, if you were trying to attribute blame, there would be uh, a designer who would be clearly responsible for naming that product and putting it on the wall. Residents are going to have rights to receive information about the safety of their building uh, in a timely manner, and they're going to have a portal in which to complain to. We're going to have to gather that golden thread of information and make sure that we've got the correct information. It's uploaded uh, on the correct software system and access to health and safety information. We must make sure that all of that health and safety information is up to date at all times. This is how we think it will look with the HSC at the top. Remember, the health and safety executive has never overseen regulations before. Now, I am reliably told that the whole of this building safety regulator process is going to be funded through fines. So um, expect uh, buildings that have had no maintenance work or remediation work undertaken that are at high risk uh, to be the very first ones that they're going to be looking at. They're going to have two teams of inspectors, one for building control, thinking about new projects that have got to meet this process, and the second for health and safety. There's going to be three committees, as shown there on the left, answering into the building safety regulator. And then underneath that, you're going to have the principal accountable person. Underneath that, the BSR, uh, the building safety, uh, sorry, the building safety manager, and then the team of consultants underneath. Now, we now are qualified and we roll out the building safety manager role and gathering all that information and putting the safety case together and making sure that uh, the building is safe moving forwards. So with regards to timeline, you might think, how quickly is this coming in? A registration uh, opens for buildings of uh, 18 metres or seven storeys, whichever comes first, in April 23. We're told that that closes in October 23. That may get extended. I don't know, but uh, I would have thought it probably will. But then we are informed 
that you could, within 28 days of registration, be asked for your building safety case. So if you are the principal accountable person, make sure that you've got your safety case ready when you register. If you haven't, um, either get in contact with us or others to start putting your safety case together or at least doing a gap analysis. Leaseholder protection updates that were introduced. So on the 28th of June, uh, qualifying leaseholders are now legally protected under the Building Safety Act. And residents qualify if their property is in a building above 11 metres or five storeys and was their main home on the 14th of February of this year, 22. And must have owned uh, own no more than three UK residential properties. Uh, the amount they can be asked to contribute to fixing other historical building defects is firmly capped and freeholders will be acting illegally if found to be charging them for costs which they shouldn't be. So there is now within the Building Safety Act this waterfall payment structure. So your first port of call is the developer. So you must be calling at them, even if they aren't a pledged developer. There are 49, 50 developers that have signed the pledge, but not the contract yet. So you must make sure you're calling at the developer's door, first of all. Building owners. So where building owners have the means and wealth to pay in full for historical remediation works in their building, they will not be legally able to charge leaseholders for any cost for those works. All owners with a group net worth of two million per relevant building they own will pay in full for these works. That's not very likely to be fair because um, the, the value is uh, in most instances less than two million. Leaseholders can only be charged £10,000 over a 10-year period outside of London and £15,000 inside of London. So um, the amount of money that leaseholders can now be charged um, is um, uh, firmly restricted uh, to a sensible amount. However, if there is no developer and the building owner is less than, worth less than two million per relevant building, um, you could only get 10,000 pounds over a 10 year period, doesn't contribute much towards the work. So you might think, well, how am I gonna get this funded? You would apply to the building safety fund. And um, we've got some updates on that in a moment, which are very, very useful. So gateways within the building safety, there are three gateways, and this is a really sensible approach, and I like this a lot. So uh, stage one, planning, think about your design, what are you doing with regards to that? Stage two, before the works start, and stage three, when the building works are complete. So gateway one covers the planning stage of a building. Planning applications now need to demonstrate that fire safety requirements have been considered and you have to produce a planning statement, um, a fire statement within the planning permission that says this is how we're going to design the building. This is how this is going to be the route to escape. This is going to be the materials and so on. And this is what it's going to look like. So really sensible. Think about it before you go any further than planning. Gateway two requires the building safety regulator to be satisfied that a building design meets the functional requirements of the building regulations. Come back to clause B41, during design, have we designed it to that basic clause from 1984, B41. Construction duty holders will need to submit critical information to the building safety regulator to show that it is compliant. So really good. Gateway three begins when construction uh, on site starts. When it's completed, you've got to prove what you've put in gateway two is actually what's on site. So a really common sense approach. Gateway one, planning stage. Gateway two, during design. Gateway three, proving what you've designed and at planning stage is on the building. And we've got lots of buildings going through this process at the moment. So a very straightforward and sensible case. So the Building Safety Act 2022, in summary, applies to new higher risk residential buildings, 18 or seven storeys, whichever comes first. Existing higher risk buildings in scope, 18 metres or seven storeys. First of all, you would have to register uh, the higher risk buildings, you'll have to produce the uh, golden thread of information and then the safety case and the safety case report. You would then have to have the building assurance certificate to ensure that the building can be legally occupied. And then there will be an annual management 
um, of that process to make sure that all of the items that you need to undertake, for example, servicing of an automated opening vent, fire door surveys, et cetera, all of those items are undertaken, which we think will be the building safety manager's role. So massive changes to regulations and how that is going to move forward. So quite colossal, the changes that have come in and are coming in. So all need to be very well prepared for them. The EWS1 form, key that we just have a snapshot on the EWS1 form. Now, the biggest point I would get across, it is a lender's form. It is not a health and safety form. So it is there to say if there are any costs for remediation works to make it compliant. And there has been various changes in scope with the form, different guidance on the form, and it has changed over uh, since it was uh, introduced in December 19. Again, all our surveyors and fire engineers are qualified here at FRC to undertake these forms. We're right now on our third edition of the form. It's all digital um, and it works pretty well. There are some height categories that have been introduced as listed there on the left hand side of the screen um, saying what, what when an EWS1 form is needed and what the criteria are. So we can send you copies of those should you need to um, understand it a little bit more. But please remember, it is the lender's requirement. It is not um, down to the managing agent, the freeholder. It, if the lender wants an EWS1 form, they will ask for one. And we even see them on a block of flats where it's only, uh, let's say, a two up, two down that's been converted. Funding. So let's look at funding and how this process is going to work. We have the one billion pound building safety fund, uh, which closed on the 31st of July. I think we're up to about 1.258 billion was the last figures that I saw on that. So it's uh, all uh, spent as far as we're concerned. However, the government have done something quite brilliant and introduced the four and a half billion. And that is all uh, as the same category there for buildings over 17.7 meters. You would need to get a PAS 9980 report. And then the fund, we are reliably told, will cover all items that are in that PAS guidance, uh, in that PAS report to make sure the building is safe. We then have the developer's pledge. So if, if your block is one of the um, blocks built by one of the 49 developers that have signed the pledge but haven't signed the contract, uh, you will get the developer to rectify the work. They may say they're not interested in doing it and pass it over to a company like us. We've got several that are in that position. They may want to argue about the scope of the work. And there is that massive mix bag. We are seeing some developers that have been absolutely fantastic and are saying, get on with the work before the contract is signed. Hopefully the contract will be signed this side of Christmas. However, we're seeing some developers now say, um, we want to take your EPS render system and cut cavity barriers into it. Just as a point, that will not meet the Building Safety Act regulations, that will not meet um, the new building regulations that we looked at very early on in the presentation. Um, so there is an issue there for developers. They are going to have to remove a lot of the facades on these buildings because they won't be able to meet new building regulations. Remember, tie that into the 84 Building Act. They've got to get regulations, got to get building regulation approval in accordance with the Building Safety Act. So there's, there's going to be a colossal issue with that. And I'm really uh, interested to see what the contract says. However, you might I'd say, well, I've got a block and it's below 17.7 metres. What am I going to do? Some more great news coming through. Um, I was with Homes England last week um, going through the mid-rise scheme. So there is a scheme coming out um, for buildings of 11 to 18 metres. It's not yet confirmed. It's all in draft format at the moment. We're working very closely um, to give feedback and so on and expected to be out I think probably March, April 2023. I'm hoping, hoping it's going to be on the same format as the four and a half billion. So there could be some fantastic news there 
for residents lessees of buildings in that category 11 to 18 meters just with the four and a half billion fund you have to make your application it goes through a triage check and then a technical check and then you get confirmed the funded elements hopefully that simple process is going to apply to the mid-rise scheme um, previous fund applications, if you're in the old fund application and you got refused, we would always urge you to reapply with a new pass report to the new four and a half billion pound fund. And as we said, there is a mid price scheme fund coming out. We've got one building at 17.67 metres and that was refused. This fund, it will simply slip into the mid rise scheme. So some great news there from that side and the process is getting better and faster. But it all comes from under taking the FRA EW, so making sure that you've got that correctly undertaken. Must make sure that you work with the fire service and make sure that you have checked the internal compartmentation, notify the developer, and also if you have a warranty on the building as well. You must progress those elements as well as your building safety fund applications. So you've got to show that you've exhausted all other avenues so and again we can help with that snapshot on wales uh wales building safety fund um fantastic process working on buildings of over 11 meters although the initial priority is given for building of 18 meters or seven stories uh and it's got 248 expressions of interest the problem in wales is much smaller than england however they do still have some very serious issues so there'll be uh, quite a lot of work going ahead there and we've got to think about resource in england and wales have we got enough resource not just from the consultancy side, contractors, tower cranes, um, uh, design, etc., right the way through the process. So our complete process for building fire safety compliance, type one fire risk assessment, followed by an external report and an internal compartmentation if needed, update that FRA and make sure an action plan and strategy is developed with regards to works that are necessary. Get those emergency works undertaken, then we'll produce a detailed design pack, not just some sketches of the building on a Google Earth plan. We produce a three, 400 pace detailed tender documentation, send it out to tender to rep reputable credit checked companies, either principal facade contractors or main contractors. And we select the contractors depending on the projects. We have projects from a million to 20 million going through at the moment. Undertake the pre-contract, make sure that the contract is properly tied up and that everyone understands what their liabilities and requirements are. Once we've placed that contract, we then access the lead consultant right the way through that process with our employed clerk of works, fire engineers, building surveyors, project managers, architects and designers, making sure that that whole project is complete but you must gather that information for the building safety case at the same time as the process is moving forward so in summary uh, we've got seven minutes spare uh, so in summary the fire safety act 2021 makes assessing the external walls including attachments mandatory fire safety england regs from Jan January 23rd, 2023, it is essential to get your secure information box installed with all of the correct information. And then we have the Building Safety Act still in the process of being fully finalised. And once it comes into force in April 2023, new and existing buildings over 18 metres and seven storeys will be subject to stringent new sets of requirements, including the safety case report and the golden thread of information. So don't forget that Building Safety Act is now getting regulations to apply historically to buildings. So a massive change in the way things are going to work. Construction regulations has never seen any any changes like this um, it is colossal but all pieces of those three legislation will make uh, the life safety of the occupants and the asset more valuable and insurable and mortgageable so some good changes coming although they are going to be very hard work to comply with um, what we do at FRC anything to do with external wall reports 
the whole lead consultant process, then we're dealing a lot of training and consultancy at the moment, and also the building safety manager role, including all that information gathering. So lots of uh, items there that we deal with, and we are part of the RSK group, so we have resource at our fingertips for any other services that you may need, as well as working with lots of other um, uh, technical problems, cardinal risk management. Uh, we're an armor partner, and as we said, Blake Morgan and Bletchley for any insurance problems that you may have. We developed a fire alarm system which can get rid of waking watches. What a what a lot of cost a, a waking watch is. I wouldn't say a waste of money if they're a good waking watch, but a lot of the time um, they're not quite a waking watch. We found so we've developed a fire alarm system that is installed into the cavity, which gives eight minutes extra warning and um, means that we can get rid of that waking watch. It also on lower blocks can be used in certain instances as a permanent uh, rectification. So that's it for me. Uh, thanks for attending and listening. You will get a CPD completion certificate. Um, and there is a, a link there to the um, Google review. If you want to scan that, that might make it easy. I really appreciate it. You know, as, as I say, for six years, we've been running education sessions. We've been tracking legislation, guidance, changing, educating, um, not just our customers, uh, lots of lessees, bodies. Uh, you know, I sit on the armor panel um, uh, for the building safety group and running lots of educational sessions through Armour and the Property Institute and the IRPM. Um, if you need anything at all, um, you know, please do get in touch. Uh, inquiries at frconsultants.co.uk. Um, our phone number's there. It'd be nice to get a few phone calls rather than um, thousands of emails. Have a look at our website, see what we do and how we can help you moving forward. Um, that's left us five minutes for questions, but mm -hmm. Hannah, I don't know if you can just run through the questions, please. Um, and uh, let's run through a few of them. Yeah, of course. I'm just checking you can hear me. Yes, yeah, all good. Yeah, perfect. Um, so uh, one question um, that we had is, in your professional opinion, will the Building Safety Act definition of higher risk buildings be dropped from 18 metres to 11 metres in height? Um, it, it could well do. It wouldn't surprise me if we think about what Wales are doing with their building safety fund. We're also introducing funding in England from um, uh, down to 11 metres. Um, it wouldn't surprise me whether that's in two years or whether that is in um, four or five years time uh, that it, it, it gets um, uh, the scope, uh, the height gets reduced to increase the um, increase the number of buildings. Um, but I do think we've got to think about resource and a sensible time frame to do that over. Um, you know, we could, everyone's going to be very, very busy uh, just talking to the government about PAS reports and how many PAS reports have to be done. Um, that's the first part of the journey. Um, so we've got to consider resource, building safety um, uh, manager resource, building safety regulator resource. We've got to think about all of that. I think there's going to be quite a few teething problems before we think about dropping the scope, but it probably will happen. Um, yes, I would have thought so. Um, one lady asked, she has a building of seven storeys, which is less than 18 metres. Which funding category does that fall into? Sorry, so you broke up then. Sorry. That's, oh, sorry. Uh, um, uh, so a building of seven storeys, but it's less than 18 metres. Which funding category does that fall into? We'd have to do a height verification report. The category of um, for the funding and why? We couldn't make it all the same. Uh, the, the, the category is 17.7 metres, measured from the lowest point to the finished floor level of the uppermost habitable story. Um, so we'd have to do what's called a height verification report on that and check the height. I'd urge you to do that as quickly as possible so that you're ready to know which one you're fitting into. If it measures at 17.7 or over that dimension, we'll pop it into the four and a half billion. If it is less than that, we'll get a pass report done for you and get ready to get you applied to the mid-rise scheme. And that would be my suggestion to everyone that is thinking of applying to that mid-rise scheme. Make sure that you have got your pass report ready and that you can apply when registration opens. So Hopefully that's going to be March, April, but I don't know, that may well change. 
Uh, one question is um, for managing agents, should they now be booking new fire risk assessments for all blocks to include an FRAEW? So with regards to um, uh, your standard, and I would call it a type one fire risk assessment. So it's a non-intrusive and it is two common parts. I think there's got to be a common sense approach with this because we've got to stage the way that this comes in. So we've got a block of flats and your next fire risk assessment is due in June. Now you should know if there's some form of cladding on the building or not. And I would say, wait until June to get your type one fire risk assessment if you know that there is no cladding. However, if you don't know the, the wall makeup of the building, um, at least get someone to visit and see if there is a um, if there is cladding or there is concern about that external wall so that you could start to implement that process. Remember, PAS report resource is going to be quite scarce moving forward, especially as the government open up um, their panels of PAS reporters, um, which will be on. Um, it, so that's going to it's going to get harder and longer to get a, to, to get a PAS report. So, yeah. Check, check if you're type one and again send send us your type one and the address uh, we'll have a look at it for you in here and see if we think it's got any um cladding on it and if so i would suggest getting a pass report done immediately but if you know it hasn't got it just wait for the next um pa uh, the next fra type one date to come around and that should work uh, quite safely i think we've probably got time for one more um there are quite a few more questions but obviously we will um go through these and respond to them separately um obviously if anyone has any questions they can email uh it's not a problem um it's asked as a managing agent how would we be expected to know exactly who is in the building and their mobility or disablement if lessees are able to rent out the property Okay, so that's a really good question. And it is a problem. That's why part of this EEIS is coming in. So about the information sharing, and it will cover tenants as well as lessees. Um, if I was a managing agent, um, and some tell me that it's not practical, but uh, I would at least be trying to get um, a survey sent probably every three months, maybe every six months, a standard questionnaire that everyone fills in. I would also know on my system which um, blocks, which flats are tenanted um, to see, um, you know, and paying attention to those as well to make sure that the landlords know that they need to be telling us exactly anyone with any mobility issue whether that is wheelchair bound or whether that is just someone that walks um with a stick or, or crutches yeah we've got to make sure that anyone with a mobility issue we understand which apartments they live in and uh and how long it takes them to get out or what assistance they need but but make sure that you send a standard questionnaire round um to them and also put notices in the property as well so tenants you know there are some good tenants out there that will want to be interested in what's happening with the block although they're not the long lessee um so let's you know, make sure it's easily accessible for them um to advise you so that's my suggestion i think there'll be lots of other things that come out under the eeis as that develops but as we said it's quite complicated and uh, quite complex Yes. Okay. Um, Any other questions? We'll come back to you uh, via email. And, yeah, uh, I've got a we'll list go of them. them. I will send all the questions and the contact details um, across to the both of you this afternoon so you can go back to people directly. Um, Fantastic. And I'll send out a copy of the recording so anyone that couldn't join us live uh, will be able to watch the session back and get in touch with you. Um, Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Dorian. That was brilliant. I think really, really informative. I've, I've actually learned a lot too. <laughs> Uh, lots of information in there. I, I don't apologise about that that volume of in, of information. It has covered 35 years of my career, summed up in an hour and a half. But what I would say is that it is, as described by Dame Judith Hackett, complex and confusing. So if you need clarity with that, get in touch because we can help unravel that confusion for you. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I will be sending out a copy of the recording, as I said, with um, FR Consultants contact details. Um, if anyone would like to join us for our next webinar on the 6th of December, then you can register on the News on the Block website. 
Um, otherwise, thank you very much for joining us today and hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. guys. Bye.